Welcome to July 7 News, take a top stories in cryptocurrency and assets and bring them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, it's really one big story, and there's a lot of different multifaceted aspects of it, but it's titled Cardano approaches a new major upgrade as ADA posts an inspired rally. This is really all has to do with moving forward with the roadmap as far as Cardano and moving into the Gogan era as far as smart contracts. And there's a, a lot of different minutia that we have to take a look at and really disseminate to find out exactly what's going on. And uh, hopefully I'll get a little help from uh, my friend Hashoshi, another YouTuber, to explain uh, some more of the technical side. So uh, we'll go over all that and there's a lot of information to go over. But first, let's take a look at what is going on in the market. So today it is February 17th, 16th, 11.40 a.m. Uh, Paso, Texas time. So here's what we got. Uh, again, uh, I think that Bitcoin went above 50,000 for a very short amount of time. But like I've always said, when there are round numbers, people are going to take profits. So just expect a retracement. That's just how it is. But uh, I'm happy for that because, uh, you know, if you would dollar cost average, uh, this would be a pr great time for you. Bitcoin, I have stopped purchasing. Uh, I have my limit at, and I already have my positions and I've already talked about how I believe it's going to go to 150,000 and then it's going to retrace to around 30, 40,000. So anything over that, I don't see a point in actually purchasing anything else. I'm uh, trying to get more into the DeFi space because I think that is the uh, the biggest opportunity for growth. And I look at uh, places like Aave and Synthetics, which I'll be doing more of a, a video on later. Anyhow, uh, Ethereum down to 1744 after getting to 1800. So that's good. Tether's Tether, yeah, sure. Polkadot, and again, in that fourth spot and uh, up 3% for almost 30 bucks. It's amazing uh, the, the kind of run that Polkadot has had. And uh, again, if you're going to bet on anything, you're going to invest in anything, invest in people. So if you take a look at um, what I call the Ethereum Mafia, kind of like the PayPal Mafia, you got Gavin Wood, Dr. Gavin Wood, who created Ethereum alongside uh, Vitalik Buterin, Charles Hoskinson uh, for Cardano. Uh, so you take a look at those two products you like, or three products you like, you know what, I'll bet on those people because they've already done uh, big things. So that's why you see Cardano, Polkadot, and Ethereum pretty much in the same place. XRP is uh, down a bunch, and that is because uh, there was an article which talked about how uh, Ripple and the SEC looks like they're not going to be able to come to an agreement. And uh, if you know anything about cases and lawsuits, you know this could drag out for a, quite a long time. I'm not here to bust anybody's bubble. But I've been through a lawsuit and I can tell you right now it is long, it is expensive, and uh, there's a lot of different circumstances to really get out of it. And there's a lot of factors in play. So if you think this is going to happen anytime soon, I don't think that's happening. So sorry. Anyhow, Binance coin down 3%. Litecoin, what else we got? Anything up majorly? Not really. Ooh, 16% for Cosmos. I don't have Cosmos, so I don't really care. And again, uh, on my channel, just so you know, I'm super biased towards... <laughs> <laughs> all the things that I own, and uh, just how it is. But uh, if you're a Cosmos holder, congratulations. Good for you. Ave, I'm down 12%. Hey, what are you going to do? Theta token down 6%. Everything's down right now. And again, uh, once we hit these highs, we're going to see a retracement. Let's take a look at, first of all, let me blow this up so somebody can see it. Sorry about that. And what I want to take a look at is what is going on as far as the sentiment of the market. So let me just click on this projected range. Okay, so this is from Trade the Chain, and you can take a look at what the sentiment is as far as like tweets and all the things that are going on in the different uh, websites and blogs and Twitterverse. So I don't know any of these. I don't know Telos, Cream Finance, Mainframe Horizon, Blockstack, but apparently hey, Telos, Telos is going to go up 16%, maybe down 13 in the next hour. That's kind of a crap range. Trust Swap, uh, negative four to plus four, Grin, yeah, whatever. Maker, Celsius, that's pretty interesting. Still bearish. I see it going down. But uh, if you want to check that out, there's a link in the description. Let's just jump into today's top story because this, to me, really is the big thing. And Cardano is just one of those projects that uh, takes a long time. They've done a lot of different, uh, I mean, to really just a creep into things. But I think it's going to be big. Look, we're almost hitting its all time high of like $1.13, $1.18, somewhere around there. We were at, uh, I think, 93 cents at one point. We'll take it. So what's going on? What is the catalyst for what's happening? So there's been a major up upgrade, and this is from the, uh, all the ADA posts. So just to go back in time, this article was written on February 14th, but it states here on February 3rd, Cardano's development firm, uh, IOHK, uh, successfully connected the hard fork and applied the Gogan native token upgrade, known as the Mary upgrade to the Cardano's testnet, which transforms the blockchain into a multi-asset network similar to Ethereum. And uh, the things that really vary as far as Ethereum is fees, gas fees. And um, there was a, 
there was a, a tweet from Ray Yusuf. He is the owner of Paxful. And he talked about how great uh, non-fungible tokens are if it wasn't for the fact that it just costs like 170 bucks just to get it up and going if you want to do a non-fungible token. And we all see these with like the fees for ERC-20. And we'll get into that. But, uh, you know, this upgrade we'll, we'll talk about in a bit is really going to decrease uh, almost to nothing our fees. And it's pretty amazing how they do it. So um, the team expects to have launched the main net by the end of February. So let's back up. First of all, let's take a look what they're talking about as far as uh, the Gogan roadmap and Cardano. I will link this in the description. It's just the roadmap.cardano.org. And what it talks about here is, actually, let me blow this up so everybody can see it. It makes a lot, a lot more sense if I can actually show you what you're looking at. So Gogan itself has the ability to build dApps, decentralized apps on Cardano's solid foundation of peered reviewed research and high assurance development. So that was the big thing, because when people always talk to me, they're like, well, what has it done? Who is building on it? What is going on? But you have to understand, you couldn't really build too much on it because they need the Gogan to, to come into play. So now that Gogan is here, uh, now you can start to have dApps. And they've built their own language, Plutus. They've done a lot of things as far as like making it very easy to uh, build on it. So I expect things to take off. And the real question was always like, well, why the heck does it take so long? See this part right here where it says peer-reviewed research? And people are like, what are they talking about? And all this means, let me, let me come back here. All this means for this for this, this peer-reviewed research is that they actually put these papers out and they don't have people like inside their team go, yeah, it looks good. What they do is they, they send it out and they say, we want you, uh, any kind of um, academic uh, different properties or different schools or, or, or different people to actually take a look at that, that know about blockchain, take a look at what we are proposing would this actually work or is this just not a really good thing? And it's, it's, it's always done, well, it's done a lot. Uh, as far as medicine, as far as pharmaceuticals, they wanna do peer reviewed research. So they, take, they take a look and say, this is what we have, tell us if this is total bunk or if this is actually gonna work. And this is, they are the only ones that actually do this. So I understand now why they do it, uh, just because you know uh, the same thing as far as medicine and, uh, and med medications go or, or the medical field. They can take a look at this and go, you know, hey, uh, tell us what you think. And so far, it has come back very positive. And this is the thing as far as like taking these small incremental steps to make sure it's done right. Think about some DeFi products that you know about right now. How many of those have crashed and burned just because they're trying to throw things out there? And I got to look, for, I got to tell you, for what I do as far as an entrepreneur, I'm the same way. I just throw stuff out until it breaks. I'm like, well, that didn't work out. We'll do something else. Well, let's do this. Let's do that. But when you're playing around with people's money, um, it's a little bit different than an actual product. Like if a product comes out and rolls out, I'm like, oh, that didn't work out, so we'll just change it. But when you're talking about people's money and life savings, you can't do that. When you talk about going into like Sub-Saharan Africa and making a payment system, you can't really do that. When you're talking about, you know, bringing in these like Fortune 500 companies and then just think just screw up left and right, you can't do that. And I get now why they have done all these things and it makes a lot of sense. Anyhow, let's, uh, let's move back here. So... So this is one of the goals for the Golgan era has been the creation of Plutus, a purpose-built smart contract development language, an execution platform using the functional program uh, Haskell. This allows uh, one code base to support both on and off-chain components, improving the uh, coherency and usability of the development experience compared with existing smart contract implementations. So jumping back to finish up this article, it talks about for the first time users on the Cardano blockchain will be able to create their own tokens, be it fungible tokens or NFTs. And if, uh, if you've been aware of what is going on, I think NFT is gonna be the next big thing. Uh, I have not uh, kept up to date with it, but uh, I will be delving into that a lot deeper uh, moving forward. And then this was the interesting part. And we'll get into this with hash in a bit, but Cardano's token design. So the first major difference following the upgrade is that there will be no execution fees, none. So, in, in Ethereum, we could call those gas fees, but on the Cardano native blockchain, there's going to be uh, no execution fees. Uh, this is from uh, Heinrich Pfeiffer, General Secretary of the Cardano Foundation. He states, native tokens on Cardano are forged on-chain with no need for a smart contract, and therefore no execution fees required to transact native tokens uh, on Cardano. Instead, sending tokens requires a nominal fee called the minimal ADA value, and he talks about how you can actually bundle these together and it'll increase the fee just a little bit, but uh, not too much. So again, when we take a look at what's going on with Ethereum, uh, 
it's a great platform and everybody's building on it. But the reason is, is because, you know, you really couldn't do too much with Cardano. Now that the Golden Era is here, people can start to uh, create dApps and then those fees are going to go down. I see uh, a pretty good market niche for Ethereum to really plug into. Uh, will they be the dominating force? Who knows? But I think, again, that uh, there is enough room for uh, two major players. So uh, let me skip this part and then just go to the last piece. So the big thing for me is about usability because I'm not a programmer, but when it states here, it says uh, the fact that Cardano has been implemented in Haskell, a functional programming language that is known for its high liability apps, could open up different business use cases involving large enterprises and even governments. And Pfeiffer finally states Cardano may stand up or may stand to capture an altogether different share of the market than Ethereum that have national level identity solutions, backend financial infrastructure, and powerful enterprise use cases. So what is so important about Haskell and Plutus? And it really comes down to that Gogan roadmap. So let's jump over there. And I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm talking about. And then the Gogan era also encompasses work to make Cardano accessible to wider audiences via Marlowe, which is good for me. This allows financial and business experts with no previous technical knowledge, such as myself, to create smart contracts. So Marlowe and the Marlowe Playground simplify the process for creating smart contracts for financial applications, allowing subject matter experts to directly contribute without requiring deep programming skills. This could be a big boom for potentially DeFi decentralized finance. So remember when, I, when I, we, we talked about this in the past, we say, if you don't know what to pick as far as DeFi, you don't really know about Aave, you don't really know about Compound, you don't really know about Synthetics or, or Wi-Fi, just buy Ethereum because everything's built in Ethereum. However, I think that may change. So for all this stuff, I mean, even for me, like I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm like, what the heck? It's kind of confusing what they're talking about. So really what I want to do is get somebody who's an expert, who's actually a programmer and knows what the heck they're talking about. And that's why I brought in my friend Hashoshi. So uh, let's jump over uh, to the Zoom meeting and let me have Hashoshi actually explain what the heck is going on. All right, everybody. So welcome here. We've got uh, Hashoshi from the Hashoshi YouTube video and uh, our YouTube channel. And he is one of the uh, few people that I watch uh, almost on a daily basis, uh, along with a couple Thanks, of other different YouTubers. So I brought him on because he is a programmer and he's here to answer some questions. So the first one I have is when I was, when we were reading this hash, we were talking about how with the Gogan era coming in, that now that people are actually able to uh, create dApps on the Cardano network. First of all, have you done anything with the Cardano network and how easy is it to actually build a dApp on Cardano as opposed to whatever else you might've done in the past? Yeah, sure. I think that from a perspective of, uh, I guess, experience building things, I think the most experience anyone would have at this juncture is working on sort of a test nets or playgrounds, right? Because the major updates are going to are going to come to the Cardano mainnet. Um, maybe people might know it by the name Gogan will bring eventually the ability to build smart contracts on mainnet, which then subsequently enables decentralized applications at large. So, you know, what I've done to date is I've tinkered with the two language playgrounds. So you have on one side, you have Plutus, which is the really, you know, formally verified functional programming language based on Haskell. And then you have Marlowe, which is basically an abstraction of Plutus. Marlow is intended for, um, you know, for, for people that might not be programmer programmers, right? It gives you a graphical user interface yeah. to drag and drop logical components. Hmm. If you can build a workflow and you understand business process flows, you can make then a functional Plutus smart contract that's deployable to mainnet. Uh, and that's using Marlow, which is, you know, more specifically a domain specific language. Gotcha. So, so I've worked on both. Perfect. So Hash, could you see Marlowe being used for like somebody like, like any kind of financial industry where they're like, you know, we want to build some kind of like decentralized finance. We want to cut out the middleman and we want to make this flow. We have no uh, coding ability. Could they just go in there and go just drop, just drop uh, cut and paste off they go? Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly the target. And mm. I would see, you know, business process managers, um, some, you know, I guess people who manage financial transactions, and even enterprises that want to enter into contractual agreements with, for which payment is, is processed between the two, um, they can do that using literally a drag and drop interface. And I can send you a link and you can click and you can go to the playground. You can see it in action and actually build out something on Marlowe now in, the, in a testnet environment, uh, which is really cool. 
cool. Send it to me and then I'll put it in the description so people can play around with that. That's pretty awesome. Great. And, yeah. And so that would make a lot of sense because I, I know with, um, with the different heads of the organizations for, for IOHK and, and IGO and whatever else, it seems like they're really focusing on the Fortune 500 companies, like the big enterprise yeah. type of levels. So I can kind of, now I can put the pieces together about why they want to do it like that because not everybody has developers and they kind of make it like that. Got you. So yep. talk to me real quick about the fees because, I mean, to transfer everything on Ethereum is, is crazy, ridiculous right now, even NFTs and things like that. How can yeah. this drop the fees to where these Fortune 500 companies can be like, you know what? We don't know what's going on over there, but we like what we see here. Let's go this route. Yeah. And so I, I talked about this recently on, on one of my videos where there are a lot of people now calling for no fees, right? Like, let's just eliminate fees from blockchains. It's a barrier to entry. I vehemently disagree with that idea because yeah. fees are very important in terms of the security model for most decentralized networks to be what they are. Um, and it, first and foremost, it prevents people from you know, malicious actors from just sending thousands and thousands or millions of empty transactions to the network to DDoS it, right? To denial of service attack it. Right. So when we move past the no fee idea, uh, really the biggest thing that drives fees in most of these types of networks is laws of supply and demand. There's a limited amount of block space. There's a limited amount of processing power and storage space. So those are the big three. Um, and the miners or the block makers, they have to process smart contract transactions and then they have to store the data if there's state changing information, et cetera. That's the main driver for, for fees. And Ethereum, the reason why the fees are so high is because of supply and demand. There's just not enough space in blocks and enough room in blocks to process enough transactions. So that's where we're at now. And you have, did you have a, something to add? Sorry. No, 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 it wasn't about that. It was about, so, so talk to us about real quick about block space, Ethereum versus Cardano. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Ethereum was made, was, was created, what, 2014, 15? Somewhere 15, right? yeah. Yeah. And then, and then from the, so, you know, we, we talk about um, the second generation blockchain. Now we're looking at Cardano with the third generation. So how does that blockchain size difference differentiate? So now we can have those fees, not so much because like you said, there is supply and demand. We have more of a supply over here. Yeah, I think it's just architecture, architectural decisions that were made in the development of Cardano, right? Understanding that when, you know, when Cardano really, really kicked off, and let's say, you know, ages ago, right? It's been a long time since Cardano started building. They were taking lessons learned from Ethereum back then and have continued to do so. And so you have, you know, architectural decisions like the modified UTXO model that they use, plus the, uh, you know, the proof of stake, the Ouroboros protocol for consensus, that's been developed you know voraciously over the last several years and so those are some of the things that help with scalability right you can process transactions faster you don't just have one parameter to pull on which is just block size so that it's part of part of the mix is how fast transactions can be validated securely gotcha okay so so first of all hash thanks i appreciate you coming on so lastly i'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you like just, just a, a bigger bigger type of question where do you see Cardano and Ethereum at the end of this bull run, which no, let's we'll say the end of this year, 2021, as far as market cap, where do you see it in the next five years? Interesting. I think if you look at, if you look at Cardano and what they have planned, right? The, the master plan quote unquote starts to come together this year with Gogan and then subsequently um, Basho and Voltaire, some of the governance stuff that's coming. I have a feeling likely what that will mean is that Cardano's market cap will at least double this year, in my mind, at least, if not more. I think in the five-year time span, a lot of people are looking at, at Cardano to start challenging the market cap that you see Ethereum has, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think sometimes people talk about Cardano taking the market cap that Bitcoin has, but they're so different. I, I don't think you can compare the two. You're more likely to be pulling from the money that's already in something like Ethereum. Um, but that being said, all of this is dependent on new money coming into the space. So there, there's that one caveat. I don't think it's going to be a situation where Cardano just takes all of Ethereum's market share, because there are also other projects that are involved in this fight. And it's not a zero sum game. A lot of, a lot of these projects will be successful in their own niche. And Ethereum is really going to be hedged on ETH 2.0. It could very well 
hold on to a large proportion of the market cap it already has, but maybe just add new money more slowly because there's competition. I, I have a feeling that's really what's going to happen. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with that. I think there's, there's room enough for two, but uh, again, we will see. So you heard it here first. Hoshoshi said uh, $10 uh, to Cardano at the end of this year. Great. Thanks, Hash. One can only pray. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I appreciate it. Let's jump back. Okay, so I hope that helps. Now, you know, Hashoshi, he's one of those guys that is always in my description of every one of my videos uh, of all the different YouTubers that I watch almost on a daily basis. So you can check him out along with all the other people that I have down there. So let me just finish up with, with this. And that is that if we're talking about Cardano, I've got to talk about stake pools because uh, I just want to talk about my own. So just so you know, DNews has its own stake pool. And just so you know, we now have two. And the reason that we have two stake pools, and you can find all this information at pooltool.io. Actually, an easier way is in the um, description of every one of my videos. If you just scroll down the Dan Cardano stake pool, there's a link right there. It'll take you to the actual web page. And if you just scroll down to uh, wallets, uh, it, it'll tell you everything you need to know about how to stake with, uh, with DNews. But what I really want to talk about is that Two things. Why do we why do we now have two stake pools? Well, first of all, it's easy. If you go to pooltool.io uh, and search for DNews, you can see how much are active stakes, the fees and epoch fees, all those things. But also, if you scroll over, you can see this thing called lifetime ROS, return on spend. And usually, the industry average for Cardano stake pools is between four and six percent. Right now, for the first one, we're uh, around five point three five. If so for, we've been up as high as 5.42, and then I think we're down to 5.26, but we're always ab above average. And the reason is because we use the Microsoft Azure network with uh, Kubernetes, and we are, try to be up as much as humanly possible, 99.9%, .9%, if not 100% uptime, so we don't miss any rewards. On top of that, the reason why we uh, just started last week, the uh, DNews stake pool number two is because of this. If you go to uh, pool.pm and look for DNews, I'll link that in the description as well, you can see that our saturation point is at 48%. So why would we uh, make a new one? Well, in a couple of weeks, I think uh, in March or so, they're going to uh, set the limit for the maximum to around 32 million, 31 and a half million, somewhere around there. So we wanna get ahead of this because if you stake to a saturated pool, something like this will happen. And let me blow this up. When you have too much saturation, you will everybody who's delegated that pool will lose rewards. So in this case, they are oversaturated 70%. So you're losing 70% reward loss. Before that happens, we need to make sure that we get in front of that. So right now, I, if you want to stake with the uh, uh, DNews stake pool, uh, you can go, and, first of all, watch that video, which explains how to stake through your Daedalus, Yolroy, or ADA, ADA Light Wallet how to find that stake, that second stake pool, which is pretty easy. You just go to DNews and just find the ones that, that have the very few uh, uh, least amount of delegates and just delegate to that. And uh, watch the video and we explain exactly why, in my opinion, or our opinion, uh, Cardano staking is uh, vastly superior to Ethereum staking. There are no slashing rewards. You can move in and out anytime that you want to. And it's just, it's just a really simple process and it's just autom automated. So uh, that is it, that is it for today. So. Um, Actually, no, that's not it, excuse me. There is a couple of things I wanna talk about. I forgot about this. So as far as Cardano goes, um, people talk to me and they say, well, you know, Cardano is gonna be the greatest thing ever. It could be, but you have to look at what's going on right now. There's a website called cryptofees.info. And when we take a look at this, you can see um, all the different crypto projects and what people are actually using right now. So we take a look, Ethereum is the number one. This is as far as fees go, this is where you can see like what is actually being used. So Ethereum is being used massively and people are paying massive fees. Next one is Bitcoin. Next one is Uniswap, SushiSwap, Compound. It's a good one to get into. And you can see that the more fees that are added up, the more people are actually using it. So when we take a look at this, we're like, well, shoot, what is, you know, we go all the way down. There's not really much anything that is going on as far as Cardano at 5,916, which is right here. Not too much. So people would just assume that, okay, well, Cardano is never going to make it because that's just how it is. But I want you to remember one thing. Now, I'm not here to say anything that uh, one person is going to win or, or, or one's going to you know, dominate. I think there's room enough for two, just like we talked about uh, in, that, uh, in the article. But if we take a look here, I just want to show you internet browsers. And if you're old like me, you can remember these internet browsers. But just as a quick refresher, 
people always talk about, well, this, it's only going to be uh, Ethereum for a while. Remember Netscape Navigator? Well, that dominated in the 90s, and then all of a sudden, Internet Explorer came around. Again, people don't know because they're not old. You don't remember this stuff. So then, well, what happened? Well, that would just stay on top, right? And this thing called Firefox came up. And before you knew it, that started to take over. Yeah, not really, but it would take a little bit of time. And then all of a sudden, as time went on, 2005, 2006, and 2007, there's going to be this, this web browser. It's going to start to pop up at some point. <laughs> and it's going to be talking about Google Chrome. But Google Chrome wasn't really much of anything. Then all of a sudden, it took a year, a couple of years, really started to really play a part. Firefox was supposed to be the next one, didn't make it, and then Chrome came in. Why did Chrome come in? Well, it was just better, it was stronger, and it was faster, and it was backed by a lot of different uh, companies and industries that really put their weight behind it. Of course, Google was the biggest uh, uh, player. So when we start to talk about, well, Cardano will never make it because Ethereum is just so up high. True, could be, but as time goes on, we will see who uh, will be the dominating force. Again, I think there's enough room for, for more than one browser. Like right now, I'm using the Brave browser. Some people use Google Chrome and some people use something else. So whatever you want to do. But uh, that is it for today. So if you made it this far, I want to say thanks for watching all the way in. I appreciate it. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. Also, consider subscribing because a lot of things we talk about are time sensitive. And that is it for today. So thanks so much. Uh, I'll put uh, two more videos up if you like this one and uh, what YouTube do is magic. That is it. Thanks so much for watching. See you on the next one.